The, this month, our external speaker is Professor Saran from the Portmouth University. The Professor Saran research interest in physical metallurgy and processing. Before he worked at the Swansea University, Cambridge University, Manchester, and also in South Korea. And today's talk is specifically going to talk about the abnormal grain growth in electrical steel theory and argument and he will present his uh, latest research. Uh, thank you Professor Sang uh, and it's over to you. I did uh, previously with uh, Sun Yi Shen uh, when I was in uh, Postage in South Korea uh, with uh, under the supervision of my the late uh, professor uh, Professor uh, Bruno de Kuman when I was his postdoc in South Korea and uh, I will cover some of the results on that time, uh, which is opened my eyes about the electrical steel about 15 years ago. And then I will uh, go through uh, a work of my two PhD students, uh, Alina Doom and Dwayne Hawizi. Uh, they were very good, my very good PhD student. They both work on electrical steel. So I'm presenting most of the work here uh, based on their PhD thesis where they finished last year. And then Fiona Robinson, uh, she was always our uh, uh, industrial collaborator from Cogent Orb, supplying materials, and we have a very fruitful discussion uh, with Fiona. The alloy, we've been using it for uh, many centuries. In fact, uh, the first uh, silicon uh, uh, iron electrical steel was produced in uh, 1905. So at the time, they just put a little bit of silicon, and they were originally designed to replace iron rot alloy in transformer, and they noticed is have got much better magnetic property if we put a little bit of silicon. But it wasn't till the, till 1930 was first uh, a grain oriented steel was discovered. And later on in 1934, when Norman Gross was patented, and I'm showing here the uh, United States patent number here, when it's very nice when you look at that patent, it's actually not much difference from the way they, uh, uh, we, we, we write the thermo, uh, uh, mechanical processing and so on. So what uh, Norman goes in 1934 patent and he said if you have a good combination of a chemical composition and along with uh, uh, thermomechanical processing and proper and suitable heat treatment then we will give a texture for silicon steel to have a good magnetic property when magnetized along its uh, uh, rolling direction. And after six years uh, or five years in 1939 and 40, then the first commercial gross uh, grain oriented electrical steel was produced and since then it has been widely used in, in transformer. Now, when is, so why, why silicon and aluminium just uh, probably is boring for you guys who uh, are uh, familiar with electrical steel, but is a good revision for the guy who are not uh, familiar with electrical steel. So why you put aluminium and silicon in electrical steel? Because both of them are uh, uh, re reducing, increasing the resistivity to, in, uh, to reduce the induced current. These two alloy, uh, these two alloying elements are both uh, alpha stabilizer and they are occupying a substitutional site in the iron alpha unit cell. So they are kicking off one of the iron atom and sitting down in the lattice. So they making solid solution. So they are not making any ordered uh, uh, phase, but they are making disordered uh, uh, solid solution with iron and they can occupy any of the of the uh, iron atom within the latent uh, cells and that addition of silicon because it has got uh, uh, a smaller atom size it will cause the lattice a little bit of uh, uh, contraction so the lattice parameter will decrease with increasing silicon content and that's i'm showing the late professor uh, the Kuhlman's equation where we were using it at the time how the lattice parameter decrease with increasing silicon content and the reason is why you add in silicon because if we substitute iron atom with silicon. Iron atom is carry 2.2 bore magnetic of magnetic moment. Silicon aluminum, they don't carry any. 
So what's happening, you are reducing the polarization for magnetization of the alloy, and hence you are increasing the resistivity and you are uh, of the alloy to do, uh, to reduce the uh, eddy current in the metal, and that's which prevent the movement or the blotch wall during the magnetization process. Now I'm just showing here, uh, I don't have a pointer in my side. So if you look at the graph uh, here, uh, you, you will see how by adding uh, by adding silicon content from non-oriented uh, free silicon steel, then you are, uh, how the resistivity is increased when you add in more silicon. So uh, this is again one of the equation we use we use for uh, how much resistivity will increase. So if you use this equation, you'll find uh, out is actually by adding only 3% of silicon, you're increasing the resistivity of the uh, uh, silicon steel uh, fourfold of the of that of pure iron. And that's important to know. So next, so if, if that is possible to put more silicon, why you don't put a lot of silicon and aluminum? And the reason is very, very simple because silicon and aluminum, if you put it in steel, they made the materials brittle and that caused a lot of tr trouble and difficulty during iron processing during the hot rolling and cold rolling there because they are so brittle, they make the alloy so brittle and it will crack during the thermal kind of processing. That's why we restrict the silicon to be around 3.2, 3.3, not more than that. Otherwise we cannot process it because it will be very hard. And in addition to that uh, problem, aluminum is, has got very high affinity to oxygen and causing extra uh, problem during making and continuous annealing. That's why we always keep the aluminium below 0.5. Now, at the advantage of, of aluminium and silicon, they are uh, both uh, ferrite stabilizers. So if you look at the phase diagram of iron and silicon, you will see if you add anything above 2.4 silicon, I'm avoiding that austenite austenite at that part. So if I pro draw a, a straight line, anything above that, I'm avoiding the austenite formation even if I uh, uh, put it above 1200, 1300 degrees Celsius. And that's giving a window of, of, of annealing window. And that's very important because I'm increasing opening the window of heat treatment, and that's very important without transforming the steel to austenite, it's remain still and and I can do the heat, uh, that's one of the reasons you can do a, a silicon steel to be uh, heat treated at 1200 degrees Celsius and even more because you are not facing uh, uh, austenite formation. So uh, if you look at the, uh, whenever they give you a chemical composition of uh, 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 silicon steel, it is always different from e every single stage is come from the uh, thermomechanical processing and annealing. Uh, for example, if I look at the as hot roll uh, uh, electrical steel com uh, chemical composition and compare it to the final product, you will see huge reduction of carbon. And in fact, the carbon should be not minimum, should be absent, but we can't do that practically. That's why still there are some traces there. So why, why, why the chemical composition is changing? I will show that in the next slides, if you don't mind hearing. So here, uh, here we have uh, how the processing has happened for electrical steel, is starting from uh, conventional steel making and casting, and then you uh, go to slab reheating at 1400, and some company then you go for hot rolling. However, uh, if you click one more, uh, one click, However, this is changed in most of the company these days because after the continuous casting, if you let it to cool it down, the steel will crack. And that's why we want to keep it hot and straight away directed, uh, connected, directly connected to the hot rolling uh, mills. And through that, we are reducing the energy for because you when you when you cool it down, you need energy to heat it up for the hot rolling. But by the direct connection, between continuous casting and hot rolling, you will you will save energy by this. And also, if you leave the high silicon steel, anything above three to cool down freely after continuous casting, then it will crack. And to avoid that, we most of the company nowadays, including uh, uh, Cogent Orb and Tata Steel in Holland, they directly connect in the, uh, the continuous casting to hot rolling. 
So in hot rolling, uh, you're reducing the uh, continuous cast uh, uh, plate to a thickness of uh, 2.3 millimeter, but still the chemical composition is changed. Click, please. So if you uh, if you look at the, uh, I'm I, I took all uh, most uh, actually most of this all in this slide uh, uh, images from Cogent or before it slows down. Uh, two years ago. So if you look at the, the materials when it's come out from the hot rolling, it's shattered and knackered, it's so tired, the material, because it's been hot rolled, deformed at very high temperature. That's why you need to go for annealing of hot rolling and slide trimming and distilling. And nowadays they use the uh, short blasting rather than chemical distilling for environmental reason to anneal it at 1100. So click. Then after that, you is ready for hot rolling, for cold rolling. Click, and this you will have after this uh, side trimming and distilling. Uh, distilling, you will have a much cleaner, free of hot side steel, and it will be reduced uh, to 0.3 millimeter, which is very very thin, and normally is in 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 in, in five uh, passes as was Trojan or was. Uh, doing it. Then what we do, we do the after the hot rolling and cold rolling is finished, we don't need carbon anymore. We need the carbon for uh, providing toughness and also the strength of the material to be hot rolled and cold rolled. After that, we don't need carbon. Otherwise, it will cause a lot of trouble for magnetization pro, uh, uh, process. And also, uh, we need clean steel. So what we do, we, we decarburize it as we call it primary annealing. At this primary annealing, what what you do, you 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 you, you do primary annealing at uh, uh, 75 hydrogen, 25 nitrogen, and water vapor as well. So the chemical reaction, I put it there for you. Let me just remove the uh, that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't remove in my side. So what you do, you have got some chemical reaction between the carbon and hydrogen, as the one I put it there. But also there is another chemical reaction with the uh, carbon and uh, water vapor, and then the carbon will be taken out. However, in the main, in the, in the same time, you add in, you nitride in the steel by adding more, more nitrogen. And why we need that? Because we need to make aluminum nitride precipitate, then it will restrain the brain growth at that time. Then after that, because we don't want abnormal brain growth to happen in the uh, primary annealing. And then the secondary annealing will, will start where you have the, uh, where we anneal it at 1200 degrees Celsius. Still, we are in alpha phase. There is no austenite because of the silicon and aluminum effect. And we leave it at 1200 for nearly two weeks in a dry hydrogen. So at that, at that process during the secondary annealing, not secondary recrystallization, that's the wrong word to use because recrystallization is all, uh, already partially or completed during the primary annealing. So this is not secondary recrystallization as falsely named, this is secondary annealing. Because the recrystallization is actually happened previously, now we are doing the, uh, the uh, rain growth. Now, at that stage, the aluminum nitride and magnesium sulfide, it will be dissolved at that temperature, and then the dream boundary will be free from then, and then abnormal rain growth will happen, and then you'll have a very large rain, high purity because there is no carbon, no aluminum nitride and magnesium sulfide precipitate, and you have got a gross, hopefully you will have a gross texture to be used at transform. Okay, next. So uh, just one point before you go here, and if you look at the image for after after the secondary annealing, you will see the 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 the, the electrical steel is really tired. Imagine you are sitting down in a big furnace at 1200 degrees Celsius for two weeks. You know, when you come out, you definitely are natural, right? And steel is the same thing. So when they came out, is actually is is the shape is not the right shape, and also the sample. That's why they do coating and also thermal flattening to make the steel uh, in a shape before they send it to the customer. Okay, next. So now microstructure revolution, this is the work we did it with Sunmi and Professor, uh, the late Professor de Kuhlman. As we see the microstructure uh, evolution through the hot rolling and cold rolling is a bit uh, complex and uh, mainly uh, the, the surface microstructure is completely, not completely, but, but, but uh, very different from the microstructure from the cross section. And that's because of the huge uh, strain and temperature gradient across the cross section, which made, especially at hot, 
uh, a rolling condition, you'll have uh, you will have a dynamic recrystallization and some of the grain at the edge uh, or close to the roller, they will recrystallize faster than the uh, one in the middle. So microstructure is very complex and you have to look at both surface and cross-section when we look at the uh, electrical steel uh, thermomechanical processing. As we go for, uh, for, for a cold rolling, uh, we, we will develop uh, alpha fiber and gamma fiber, and then next, then after the uh, 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 secondary annealing, the gross or probably cube will grow abnormally in this, uh, as we see it, this is the work by Alina Doom, uh, my previous PhD student, uh, and then it will occupy. And if you click next, you will see the entire sheet is just contained of one or two or a few grain, which produce, if, it, if you click next, the microstructure or even of the surface contain a very, very large grain of gross grain. That's what we wanted. That's what exactly we wanted. So now if you talk about the test evolution with the, the core uh, of our understanding in, in, in electrical steel uh, 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 abnormal brain growth, is I'm um, just showing uh, we have to consider the test evolution during the uh, electrical steel uh, uh, processing and annealing. I'm showing uh, uh, ODF uh, 5245 uh, section here. I'm showing uh, gamma fiber and alpha fiber. I'm afraid I don't have the curse or the uh, pointer to look at this, but if you just, yeah, so that's, thank you very much, Herin. So this is gamma fiber and alpha fiber. If you click uh, one more. So uh, during the hot rolling uh, tertia, what's happened when you hot roll it, except the dynamic recrystallization, the the most of the if 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 I'm uh, if I'm visible in the window, I'm not sure if I'm visible because I can't see myself now. So if if I look at the uh, BCC uh, uh, unit cell uh, mo during the hot rolling, uh, most of the one one O it will be crushed and aligned in a way to be aligned with the rolling direction. So so that's why you 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 have alpha fiber during the hot rolling. And if you click next. Uh, so if you cold roll it, most of the 111 uh, plane, 111 uh, plane as well will be aligned along the normal direction. There are so many simulations prove that uh, alpha fiber and gamma fiber are uh, 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 will be generated during uh, cold rolling. However, uh, in simple term, if you if if, if you have a if you have a, a BCC unit cell and if you uh, push it under this high strain rate at that low temperature, the 110 or 111 plane they don't have much choice unless they will align with the 110 aligned with the rolling direction and 111 direction will be aligned with the normal direction because basically you're just crushing all the lattice and they don't have uh, they don't have much choice unless to align themselves under that huge strain rate. Now, if you uh, click more, however, the, there are so many study um, uh, conducted in the past uh, decade that by increasing the uh, the, the the cold rolling uh, strain uh, rate, you are increasing the intensity of the gamma fiber, which is makes sense. So more one 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 direction to be aligned to the rolling direction. Now, click uh, next. And if, if we look at that, uh, this is important to understand the texture evolution during the processing. And, and the reason is because the texture, especially for the guy who believe in uh, nucleation theory, as I'll talk about it later, these texture, they are not coming from nowhere. They are actually inherited from the deformation texture and so on. So most of the guy who believe in the nucleation texture theory, as I'll talk about it in a bit, in a bit, they believe Sorry, yeah. Uh, they believe any anything. Uh, am I fine? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Ah, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. I thought somebody asked you a question or something. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, these are a point where where I indicated that said is believed to be the nucleation texture from the gamma fiber, and then with 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 further annealing, it will be uh, 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 reoriented or rotated toward the gross or to the rotated cube or 
tube and the final annealing. So these tertia is very interconnected from the deformation tertia to the transformation to the annealing tertia. That's why we have to understand the tertia evolution during the cellular processing. Next, now uh, before I start uh, going through the result uh, we uh, obtained in the past uh, uh, four or five years, uh, I just want to uh, remind you about the tertia evolution theories uh, of the uh, uh, accord during the electrical steel uh, processing uh, to make the discussion and also the uh, easier. Uh, so the first theory we depend on and most of the uh, uh, scientists depend on and even in industry uh, is oriented nucleation theory. So these guys, they believe uh, when you cold roll the material, when you cold roll the material, there was huge amount of shear uh, shear uh, and transition and deformation band will be occurred, and the and 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 the gross uh, with others gross with other or or a specific orientation will originate and and nucleate more rapidly than other orientation, including gross. And that will give a preference for the growth to grow normally later on during the uh, final recrystallization. So these guys, they think, they think uh, th is actually the growth brain is nucleated during this crystallization. So if you click, so we, we uh, uh, thank you, Heron. Uh, so uh, if we, uh, we, we did that with Sun Me to prove the theory. In fact, it's actually for the recrystallization uh, stage is makes a lot of sense because we capture some of the ghost brain uh, during the uh, uh, from uh, after uh, in, in, in cold war and then for the initial primary recrystallization stage. And actually, this is uh, supporting the theory when you have got high dislocation density, you, get, you can have high Taylor factor, so uh, you will have uh, more stored energy, so the grain like growth has got less Taylor factor, it will be consumed the grain with high Taylor factor. So that's the nucleation starts uh, starting from having, and that's uh, supporting the theory of the recrystallization stage. And uh, next, the other theory is uh, oriented growth theory. So these guys, they believe uh, these orient orientation, they were already existed in the early stage of the uh, processing, but they grow abnormally because they have a specific uh, boundary characteristic, uh, which is normally uh, mainly used. There are sigma five and sigma seven are responsible for uh, abnormal rain growth. For example, we captured that growth drain in a nanoscale at a very, very, uh, as you will see, there you'll see some pixels of um, uh, uh, EBSD. And uh, in fact, from our side, we couldn't verify that theory and it didn't help us to understand the abnormal brain growth that stage. Then there are other people, they think, okay, ignore the CSL boundary, but the boundary like uh, between high and boundary between 20 to 45, they are related to the abnormal brain drain, and they assume growth drain are surrounded by high angle rain boundary between 20 to 45, where they have got higher mobility than another one, that's why they grow. So we try to, uh, 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 thank you, Heron. Uh, so uh, we try to uh, validate the theory and we did a set of experiments for the past uh, four years with Alina Doom and Dwayne Hawizi. So the first argument we will try to understand if actually uh, uh, ghost drain has got uh, 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 a preference or size or orientation advantages as many literature blame that they have rain size and orientation advantages but and we try to understand that if they have this this privilege during early stage of the normal rain growth so what we did with the first set of experiment we have the primary anneal sample we anneal it at uh, uh, 10 30 degrees celsius for 10 seconds only to capture very early stage of the uh, of the uh, grain growth, and then at 1070 degrees Celsius for eight minutes. Now, what we did, we, we look at the seven by seven EBSD mapping, and uh, this is captured like 50,000 grain. And what we did, we, uh, this temperature is selected below the uh, secondary annealing temperature to capture early stage of abnormal drain growth or abnormal. So what we found out, if we look at the chart, the first chart of the, uh, I'm showing the volume fraction of each of the texture component, uh, for example, gross and blue, uh, a tube in beige, uh, brass in purple, copper in, uh, in, 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 in yellow, and so on. And I'm showing the primary annealed one in a dashed bar, uh, the dotted one annealed at 
10.30 and the plain one annealed at, at, at 10.70. Now, if you look at it, if you look at it, it's actually the ghost brain, the ghost brain doesn't have any, uh, any, any higher volume fraction of the entire other orientation in the, in the sheet. And I'm counting like 50,000 brain. In fact, uh, a cube has got higher volume fraction than rows, except the uh, gamma uh, fiber one, uh, which is highest in all three conditions. So gross strain volume fraction was low, and for some reason is decreased, even decreased with increasing annealing temperature. And we said, so we saw this randomness in the gross grain size uh, uh, distribution within the sheet. So what we decided, we we had the all uh, data of the grain size, and we looked at the histogram of it, and we separated the two main uh, grain size uh, humps or or the peaks, and we found out is actually forty uh, micrometer is a is a stage where the grain uh, grown more than normal because the annealing temperature uh, grain size. Uh, primary annealed temperature drain size was 20 micrometer, right? So anything above 40, we counted as a bit later stage of abnormal drain growth. So what we, we so that's why we separated to understand it even further, and we got the same conclusion, and we didn't find much differences, anything below that, and so on. So we tried to do another set of experiment to find out actually if we can prove that microstructurally. So what we did, we did some quasi in situ some cozy institute uh, part. So we selected some area not using indenta, uh, and it might uh, cause some uh, uh, retrospization during the indenting, so we used marker. So we, we, we have the primary anneal, we did the EBSD, then we anneal it at 1070 for eight minutes, and you uh, exactly the same size. However, we were careful about how much we go further, just in case uh, we just went by a few micrometers just in case we're missing some information in between. So when you look at the uh, uh, the blue bots and the uh, red bots here, in fact, we found these uh, uh, ghost grain, they have critical size of over 40 micrometer. And when you look at it after a and they disappeared. And then uh, that was above our, uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, it was out of our expectation. We didn't, uh, okay, so the grain, the grain advantage doesn't mean much in that early stage of, 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 uh, of, of rain growth. And then we found out, for example, in point A, we found some growth identified by, of course, uh, uh, MATLAB, and then they were still the same, or some of them, as in point B, they, they appeared without any, uh, uh, any uh, uh, small grain growth. Probably we couldn't capture that uh, very small type uh, grain size by EBSD. So, so this is a, pro a proof uh, point microstructurally and statistically uh, the grain size and orientation uh, draws that doesn't have these advantages of grain size and orientation advantages at the very early stage of grain growth. Next. So what we do, we did, uh, we try to uh, uh, validate the second argument where we uh, where we try to understand the effect of the CSL uh, boundary on the growth rates. So what we did, we um, uh, we uh, look at the all sigma five and sigma seven. These are the two main uh, sigmas or uh, CSL boundary is believed to be responsible for abnormal grain growth. And when you look at the frequency and the volume fraction, in fact, the percentage didn't change significantly after we annealed, and their distribution was rather random. And in fact, for sigma five was decreased a little bit, and uh, we didn't understand why this is actually is important a factor for the abnormal grain growth where their distribution is is very random. And when we, we did another set of AFP and we said, OK, this is a, a very early stage. Let's go for the late stage of, of, uh, of, of uh, grain growth. So we annealed the sample at uh, for 1000 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes and then for 1100 degrees Celsius for, uh, for and we found the same result. Then we try to understand how that happened statistically and microstructurally. So what we did, we took the sample which is annealed uh, uh, at uh, 1100 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes. We had like 10,000 grain to look at it and we specified 
uh, each CSL uh, 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 ring boundary, for example, a sigma 3 in uh, green, sigma 5 in blue, sigma 7 in uh, red, and so on, as you will see it in the large map there. And then we took every single orientation within that map, including, for example, uh, uh, gross in red, as you will see it in the bar, in the, in, the, in the volume fraction of the, uh, of the uh, CSL boundary. So we try to understand how much is sigma 5, sigma 3, sigma 9 are surrounding the gross drain with uh, 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 and other orientation. And when you look at the data, we found out actually around these range are very random. And, 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 uh, uh, and, and sigma 7 and sigma 9, which thought to be responsible for abnormal grain growth, were lower than cube, kappa, and rotated cube. Now we didn't we didn't verify this uh, 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 these claims by others that actually CSL is playing significant uh, uh, effect on the abnormal brain growth. And we microstructurally we looked at them and they were randomly surrounded by uh, any uh, of the of the uh, uh, CSL boundary. And we from our basic calculation we. We found out this actually is, is 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 not reasonable to suggest a small tiny differences between uh, the green boundary energy, the differences between sigma five and sigma seven can cause a centimeter or a few millimeter grain growth from that small uh, differences. Then we went back to uh, uh, validate the uh, high end grain boundary, as you will see in the next slide. So here we uh, we first of all we look at the uh, volume fraction of uh, of uh, uh, of the all uh, high end rain boundary uh, from uh, 15 to 65 and the graph was perfectly fitted in McKenzie plot and that McKenzie plot was uh, obvious that rain boundary was randomly distributed ignoring the fact that the small uh, uh, or or low end rain boundary even below 20 that's different let's say this is different distribution, but the for high end row, it was rather random. Now we did the same thing. We uh, separated all uh, the uh, grain boundary. For example, uh, smaller than 10 degree, uh, uh, we uh, highlighted in blue. Uh, between 10 to 20, we highlighted in uh, green. Between 20 and 45, which is the main focus point, we want to understand it here, highlighted in uh, red. And then we I identified all the texture component, including uh, cube in red, uh, gauss in uh, green, and we plotted how much or what the volume fraction of the each grain boundary are surrounding these individual individual orientation. And in fact, for uh, uh, and microstructurally and statistically found out that actually um, uh, uh, between 10 to 20 goes has got slightly higher than others. When it's come to 20 to 45, goes it was a little bit lower than brass, but it was a little bit higher. We couldn't make any judgment or conclusion based on that very tiny, very tiny uh, uh, differences of the volume fraction between 40 to 42. And in fact, uh, one of the criticism about this theory is, well, there are other orientations surrounding by 20 to 40 uh, uh, degree and why they don't grow up normally then. So there's a lot of criticism, but from our side, we couldn't find a solid conclusion that rain boundary will be responsible for that. So next. Then we try to uh, uh, understand the uh, dislocation, store energy, and failure factor. And I think this is more related to the uh, recrystallization uh, process during the primary annealing rather than a normal rain growth. And uh, if you just click a few times, you will see the cold roll. We anneal it at 850 for three minutes and then four minutes and five minutes. And uh, this is uh, how uh, this is, is showing actually there are uh, we, we, we were trying to capture the very early stage of the recrystallization and uh, uh, we 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 look at it in this way and um, 
uh, okay, that slide is over now. But uh, in fact, we try to uh, understand if growth grain has got the highest dislocation density. In fact, we couldn't do that. We couldn't uh, find that rotated cube was considered to be highest uh, GND uh, density as we uh, show it here. However, when you look at the next slide uh, for calculating the uh, Taylor factor, there is the growth was uh, uh, was was kind of uh, uh, equal to rotated cube and a little bit lower than the cube. So that theory of uh, having high dislocation density, which shows high store energy and then higher Taylor factor, it makes sense during the recrystallization uh, 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 stage. But we couldn't find any evidence that was have any influence during the uh, drain growth. So, so uh, uh, now we uh, try to uh, develop our own theory about this. And if you click next, then we did some experiment on 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 the effect of the heat flow direction on the abnormal brain growth. And that was the first experiment we did it. Uh, we did it uh, uh, with uh, 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 we put the sample of uh, uh, primary needle sample in a furnace and we directed the heat to be the heat flux direction to be exactly on both direction, not on the top and bottom side, but uh, uh, sides, but rather on the left hand side and right hand side. And when we did the uh, when we did the analysis after we did EBSG after this, we, we, we found that actually abnormal rain growth occurred in, on both side, right hand side and, and left hand side when exposed to the heat flow from both side. So abnormal rain growth direction was was parallel to the heat flow direction. And that was surprising for us because normally heat is second run tensor and it's not directional. So what we did, uh, if you click one more, uh, so we did, uh, we uh, we got some of the uh, thermal insulator of uh, vermiculite treated silica clothes with uh, fiber fracts. We got it from Fiona Robinson and Trojan Orb at the time. So we covered one side we cover the uh, right hand side to be the heat flows will not go to that direction, but all uh, but the sample was only uh, exposed to the heat flood on the uh, on the left hand side. And the evidence was clear. The right hand side, which was isolated, uh, insulated, it was just normal drain growth and the one was parallel to the heat flood direction was abnormally drain growth. And if you click one more to prove that uh, point again, we did the directional heating and the targeted angle. So we rotated the sample uh, at 45 angle and we saw how the grain rose is actually going through the 45 angles. And we did a lot of uh, uh, slip trace analysis, as I will show you later, that this heat flux is actually following one of the six uh, 110 direction. And as you will see on the uh, bottom uh, green one is following two and the rest is just following one of the 110 direction. Uh, next, now uh, uh, one of the uh, things we puzzled and we tried to understand it, uh, there was so many other orientation and there were so many other ghost brain on the edge. Why only one or two or a few of them grow no abnormally? Why not all the all the uh, all the uh, all the uh, ghost brain? And that's what we uh, we 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 try to uh, understand because for that little uh, stage of the nanometer, uh, uh, we have to understand it. For the longer, for the longer, uh, uh, for or for the later stage is understandable because the thermal conductivity, as in proven in uh, silic uh, in aluminium and silicon nano uh, nanomaterials or in in chopper, the thermal conductivity is increased with drain size. So later on at later stage, the gross drain will get the advantage of its own orientation and drain size, which is the thermal conductivity increase with increasing uh, the, the drain size. But however, at the very early stage, we think the drain, the gross drain are actually uh, grow along one one uh, or plane and expanded dramatically when it was parallel to the heat flux direction. Now, if you click one more, uh, uh, next slide, uh, we did uh, next. So we did a lot of uh, slip traces analysis. Uh, sorry, uh, previous one. 
just to make a point on the previous one. So what we did, we we uh, now it's clear for us. Uh, next. Now it's very clear that the uh, gross gross direction was parallel to uh, uh, after we did the slip traces. So the the, the traces I uh, I show on the map are the traces, and their perpendicular one is are the slip direction, right? And it's clear from that analysis that the gross uh, gross direction was parallel to the one or two of the O1 direction and is parallel to the heat flow. So, so that is the very early stage of the of the uh, uh, brain growth. This is what's following. So the direction was parallel to the heat flow direction. So as appear, one of the things is appear for us is the temperature is not the only factor for the abnormal drain growth, because there was so many other growth drain around. There was so many other orientation, but they didn't grow abnormally. So that what we try to understand it from uh, a neutron diffraction uh, experiment. We did it and I'm showing it in the next slide. So what we did, we applied for uh, ICE's neutron diffraction facility in uh, Oxford. Uh, after so many rejection, we finally we got some bit time. Uh, so what I'm showing here, what we did, we did in situ, in situ, uh, uh, in situ neutron uh, heat treatment. Uh, so we take a primary neutron sample, we heat treat it in situ using the neutron diffraction from room temperature to uh, 1017 with a heating rate, uh, specified heating rate. Now uh, the diffraction pattern will obtain every two minutes. Uh, so, so this is huge data, like hundreds of uh, diffraction files. What I'm showing here, I'm just showing here at uh, the peaks uh, of uh, 110 peaks, uh, 110 uh, and a few peaks at room temperature at uh, 1020, 1040, 1070. Uh, just to show, in fact, below below 900, there was little change to show anyway. But what we try to understand, we try to understand what's happened during that, why uh, gross grain is actually growing that much. So when you look at the, the delta D spacing, so this is not the D spacing I'm showing you during the lower graph, I'm showing the delta D spacing, the variation of the D spacing of, uh, uh, of the lattice plane. Of course, the, uh, this is standard and well, well established that by increasing the temperature, the D spacing elastically will expand. That's understandable. However, the 110, the 110 was expanded much more than others, and then followed by 100. This is again understandable from the crystallographic point of view. But that uh, 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 expansion rate uh, uh, or, or, or high expansion rate of the 110, it gives us the, uh, the, the, uh, the spirality of 110 D space in expansion. And that's why we thought that the gross rain is, 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 is growing dramatically if uh, if uh, if the heat floods were applied in the right direction, so if you look at the if you look at the uh, look at the uh, 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 okay you that's okay that's okay uh, you move to uh, that part because I wanted to talk about the pitch shifting but I'll talk about it later. Now we try to understand it, why that happened. So we did two sets of experiment there. First experiment we did it at uh, if you look at the ODF on high. Uh, heating rate. We did it one on high heating rate, one on low heating rate. So the ODF I'm showing it at the first row of the ODF is at 50 degrees Celsius per minute, which is high heating rate. You will see actually the alpha star fiber and gamma fiber from the ODF is going till 1070 till dramatically they disappeared and producing wheat cube and wheat growth. So we uh, look at the uh, volume fraction of the of the aluminum nitride peaks, and we analyze it. And uh, when we analyze it uh, uh, from the diffraction peak, we actually we 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 recognize that actually, if you using a high heating rate during the uh, during the annealing time, the the aluminum aluminum nitride is is dissolved very sharply to the point of ten. 70, it just disappeared completely. And that shows not only the growth, but also other orientation to grow abnormally. And that's including rotated tube, and that's including some of the tube, some of the, that's why you're getting some, 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 some uh, growth on rotated tube and tube as well in a very low 
temperature, uh, sorry, tertiary intensity. When we used, when you used uh, uh, a slower heating rate, for example, I'm showing the low bottom of the of the uh, of the ODF. We see actually the tertiary changing after even 10, 20 degrees Celsius, and the gamma prime was uh, dissolved and the com uh, alpha star fiber completely disappeared after 1040. And when you look at the volume fraction of the pre-state, which is restricting the grain growth till then, but when they dissolve, they are allowing the abnormal grains to happen. We saw that uh, if you're using the low, uh, low rate, uh, low heating rate, it was chosen by gradual, gradual, gradual dissolve of the pre -state. Then I'm starting from 1030 uh, by 1230, so you are not you are allowing the growth grain to uh, to get the advantage of that a few nanoscale to for the for the expansion to go much faster. Okay, so next, so we try to understand this further. We look at the uh, uh, the peak uh, shifting and splitting and boarding. So as I stated in the a few first slide in my talk today, uh, BCC is uh, when you add silicon, because silicon has got small atom size, it will be distorted. It will be slightly shrinked, it will be contracted. And that's that parameter is proven to decrease with increasing parameter and from the uh, uh, increasing silicon content, sorry. So if you look at the uh, peaks, you will see the 110 peaks are shifting and then you will see some peak broadening and partial peak splitting. And the, uh, the peak splitting are indication of kind of phase transformation to a lower symmetry. So in fact, the, the, the idea is when I'm looking at the silicon steel tube seal, I'm not looking for the highly cubic high symmetry unit cell. In fact, this is distorted. And that distortion, because cost of the silicon addition in a distorted uh, uh, alpha 5 provide a great crystal rapid advantage to have only one or two of the 110 to expand much more than usual and the heating it will help us to reach the dream bound to dissolve the pre-state greatly and that was the main uh, uh, from our uh, institute experiment we got it uh, next as a final slide i wanted to uh, uh, just talk about the closing theory what we understand it from valley uh, uh, assessing the previous uh, uh, theories and also the arguments and the, our closing theory on and of course we published uh, two papers uh, uh, and can be uh, find online from uh, our work with Alina Doom and uh, Duin Havizi and Fiona. Uh, we published it on our channel, it's available online if anybody wants it, I can send it to them. So what we have, we have to distinguish and what we, our solid conclusion, we have to distinguish between the early stage of the abnormal brain growth and the late stage of abnormal brain growth. So there are so many brain can, can on the edge can grow normally, but only uh, growth drain of per dominating and that's really two factor the the addition of silicon is 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 is, is distorting that you need high symmetrical unit cell of vcc structure for iron and that's causing the and when you when that one of the 110 direction one of the o one is, is exposed to the direct heat floods it will go all the way expanded hugely and because with the with increasing the drain size the thermal expansion or the thermal conductivity increase with increasing drain size so on that one one o direction it will reach the drain boundary much faster than other orientation and it will dissolve dissolve the uh, the pre-state on the drain boundary before the other drain and that's will and then with the gross drain will get its own orientation and uh, size advantages through abnormally at the later stage of the abnormal brain growth. Okay, so next slide I'm showing the uh, the uh, very cozy in situ from the primary anneal and we monitor all the secondary anneal after 1110 and how we different of the and uh, this is what gets us to this conclusion how the heat floods is helping the 110 plane to reach its uh, drain boundaries to dissolve the pre-state and then this clear boundary of gauze is already there so then the 
high mobility drain boundary will play its role at later stage of the abnormal drain boundary to expand and, and, and consume the rest of the drain in the sheet. Uh, next slide, I think this is my uh, conclusion. So my, in my conclusion, I can say uh, from our experiment and about more than five years uh, and except my previous year with, uh, in, in, in 15 years ago, uh, we come to the conclusion uh, those oriented drain do not have size or orientation or grain boundary characteristic advantages during early stage uh, of abnormal grain growth, but rather that will all these advantages will come to life at the late stage of the abnormal grain growth. And that's including the grain size advantages, orientation advantages, and 20 to 45 high mobility under grain boundary. And uh, the dislocation accumulation store energy tail effect analysis is actually very, very relevant to the recrystallization stage, but you shouldn't find any correlation with the abnormal drain growth stage. And also it's demonstrated that the gross abnormal drain growth can be theorized as, as, we, as we discussed now with the distortion of, of the cubic high symmetry by adding silicon and also the heat flux direction to uh, uh, promote the gross uh, abnormal drain growth in the unit cell. And from the institute trial using neutron diffraction, it was evident that the heating rate has direct influence of the texture control through retarding and advancing the uh, dislocation of free state. And uh, for industrial benefit, we recommended to use low heating rate uh, during secondary annealing to obtain very sharp uh, gross texture to pro use for transformer. So uh, sorry about because I, I, I think I exceeded my time uh, and thank you very much for listening and, uh, and, 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 and listen to this very long talk. Thank you very much everybody. Thank you, sir. Uh, please ask the question directly to sir uh, and switch on your camera, please. A clip, please. Thank you very much. I found that a really interesting um, talk and, and very nice to take us through each of the stages of the thinking to get to the, to the answers. So thank you very much indeed. I, I guess my question may be a bit rhetorical, but um, from everything that you've said and from the indication of the influence of um, really the thermal characteristics being the dominant ones, can I therefore assume that any inhomogeneity through thickness or compositionally that might be inherited through the process aren't really that important, provided you do your primary recrystallization and have a range of orientations at the surface, everything else is then just driven by your thermal characteristics. Is, is that about right? Well, uh, but we have to be careful when we talk about. I mean, thank you very much, Claire, for 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 that very nice question. It's a very important question, actually. Uh, we have to be very careful about when you're talking about the thermal uh, floods, because a thermal uh, thermal expansion heat, as it is, is second rank tensor, so it's not directional. So when you are when you are putting putting a heat under any any materials or any, it should be go uh, equally in all three directions because it's a second run tensor and it should be not directional as a heat. But what's happened, what we found out from, um, from our neutron diffraction data, the unit cell is not cubital, that is distorted the unit cell. And that's helping, helping at least one or two of the 110 to have very low symmetry. So this is not very high symmetry anymore by adding more silicon. And, and, and when you're occupying each of this, because they are substitutional, so you are shrinking the unit cell. By having that, when you are having a, a suitable 110 to be expanded during that, and the heat flux actually, if you direct it in a way, it will help the thermal conductivity to reach the drain boundary for the gross drain much better than, than the other orientation. In fact, if you look at the 111, uh, 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 plane and its direction, the direction will be 110. And that's why we saw m uh, the same uh, peak splitting and peak uh, 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 broadening is a happen in the cube tertiary com uh, component as well, because they are sharing that 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 value with gross brain. So so the main point is uh, from from our understanding is is the symmetry is not high symmetry anymore. 
and so many researchers uh, are, are 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 dealing with the silicon steel as a uh, as a perfect high symmetrical cube uh, and 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 uh, and this is what what, uh, what 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 we understand that's why we we don't uh, take any uh, other ideas about the crystallography except the tertia. Okay, tertia, we, we understand it for so long. Uh, if you scratch it, if you you will get the specific tertia. Term. But what I'm, what we try to understand, the heat is actually, the heat flux is very, very critical on the direction because we saw to, to help that type of the expansion of the specific uh, plane. That, that's if I can, I could answer your question. Okay. No, thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot, Leah. Uh, hi, I'm just going to take over from here, uh, as he has to leave. So I am uh, just going to take over the questions. Has anyone got any further questions they'd like to ask? But maybe I can ask a, a different question. Um, sure. In terms of, you know, you've, you've shown this really beautifully by using the um, different uh, heating from the sides of the sample, where you've got presumably um, a much wider sample, if you like, to, to observe the effects. If you, I know, I know we don't, but if you were to consider the silicon steel being even thinner than the 0.3 millimetres, do you think you'd, you'd reach a limit where um, these effects would, would cease to be effective? Um, I, you, you'd then not be able to prefer the um, goss grains growing? In fact, it's a good point, uh, and this question is coming uh, from uh, many, many decades ago when it started when if you have a, 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 a cold road sample, if you strain it more on a higher strain rate or the reduction rate will increase, of course you are changing the dynamic of the dislocation density and store energy within each individual, um, individual uh, grain including gross and gross is not separated from the overall grain in the in the sheet and if you are uh, talking about the thickness then that means i am rolled it much more to have much thinner uh, sheet and if you do that you are actually increasing the dislocation density gnd accumulation within that and gross grain same as other uh, orientation they are not uh, uh, separated from that so there from our understanding their deformation their 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 slip their slip on the, on the specific slip plane to make able to that 110 to be directed in a way is is play a part Although, as you said, uh, practically we didn't, we cannot verify that because we didn't have, uh, we didn't, we didn't actually test it if we do it on the, but from a theoretical point of view, I think it, it will, it will change if you're using, if you're using different thickness or different bulk uh, height during the cold rolling. I, I, I think it's perfectly uh, reasonable to suggest uh, that the size will change. The, the dynamic of this phenomenon for sure, because the thickness is again is related to the to the reduction rate anyway. If I could answer your question, clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Super. Uh, Jachi, you have a question. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Professor. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm Jachi from WMG. I got a question. So your idea uh, of the growth of gauss is because of the distortion because of the silicon. But uh, my question is that why it doesn't sh uh, show up the their uh, distortion effect during the primary oxidation. Uh, I mean, at the early stage. I mean, at, even at a, a later stage, if you grow larger, it will have a size effect. No matter which orientation it is, it will more likely to consume the surrounding smaller grains. So, so your theory, I'm I, I'm I'm still struggling to understand why the effect of the distortion uh, doesn't show up at the very beginning from the primary stage. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's an important question, but I think I, I, I kind of answered it during my talk, but sorry if I didn't make it clear. Uh, let's be clear, when during the uh, primary uh, primary recrystallization or primary annealing, we have uh, the most of the grain boundary are decorated by aluminum nitrite and manganese sulfide, and they are pinning the grain boundary hugely. 
And one of the reason we are nitriding the steel during the during the decarburization process, we put in a lot of nitrogen to react with aluminium to make this prostate on the grain boundary to to not let that grow abnormally at the primary annealing. So it's not reasonable for me to uh, imagine if I have all this grain boundary and I'm creating it during the primary region for the growth drain or any other uh, grain will grow abnormally at that stage. And, 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 and bear in mind during the primary uh, annealing is the grain will grow, but they don't grow abnormally. For example, from our evidence, uh, we showed that uh, if we have if we have if you have 20, probably some grain will reach 40 micron, but not more because you are the entire grain boundary are pinned with the grain boundary. Now, now your your question is very good question. Why there is no other other orientation? Well. Uh, the only reason we could think about this is actually there is there is only one one lattice plane one lattice plane which is one one oh in the direction of one one oh can have that huge lattice expansion as we show it and we we prove it in the neutron diffraction data so what we have we have that lattice plane which is basically to be very honest uh, this is proved in aluminium and silicon and steel and 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 for some reason we don't pay attention to that uh, in, in 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 steel industry but the 110 is expanding much higher elastically than other plane and that w w w with that distortion of silicon it made that specific plane from our simple calculation that actually one or two of the 110 plane can have this advantage to expand much more superior to another grain than any other uh, orientation. However, having said that, I still think the cube has got a possibility to do the same, but not in the same extent. And that's neat. Need further further experiment to be honest to see what exactly what the difference between the gross and cube and why this uh, in our experiment I mean is is very very reasonable to suggest cube grain should grow abnormally as well comparing but but why crystallographically we couldn't reach that point to make this difference but experimentally most of the abnormal grain grows with gross rather than cube if I could answer your question. Yeah, yes, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. And now you have a question. Yes, um, thanks for the presentation. It was very uh, interesting. It was something that uh, I, I, di I didn't know. Um, uh, my question is, uh, would you would you think that the silicon content would have an effect on 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 your um, uh, gauss uh, volume fraction because you, you mentioned that by adding three percent of silicon that you would uh, 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 have a, a lattice um, distortion would you uh, by adding more silicon have a have a uh, impact on, on this effect uh, absolutely is a good question and absolutely by adding more silicon it will change it will change because you what this this was a proof of concept study we did it throughout my two uh, self-funded PhD students so I was free to do it without an industrial restriction but that was a mainly proof of concept so so uh, of course we just assume this is 3.2 if we did the same experiment if we, on 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 3.4 or by additive manufacturing to increase it to six percent as nowadays they do you will have completely kind of distortion of the unit cell and i cannot predict what the difference uh, what the difference and what the consequences will be but the distortion is starting by adding silicon because of the atomic size differences. And when you are distorting that, then by adding more, for example, the one we expect from that, we are occupying only two, two of the iron atom in the inner cell. Imagine if you put 6% of silicon, how many iron atom it will be replaced by silicon. And that's further distorting the symmetry of the inner cell. And that's further unpredictable things. And I think, I think one of the things uh, we, we miss in the physical metallurgy, I'm a physical metallurgist, uh, but, but one of the things I, I, I really miss, we, we always don't read the, the, the nanotechnology and the nanoparticle, and, and we get a lot of advantage because they do it in much, much uh, smaller scale about what's happened there, and we always ignore it because we care about the industrial application. That. But for, to answer your question, 
Definitely. The, the, the point we made, it was a proof of concept. We found this and I think uh, you are absolutely right. Putting less or more of silicon, it will change that mechanism for sure. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much. I have another question. Sure. So um, with regarding your um, green morphology. Yes. Um, so I, I was thinking, uh, would it, your uh, green morphology also have an impact on, on, on your um, volume fraction? Because I, I remember from one of your EBSD image that uh, you have a very elongated uh, grain and it seems that a very flat surface would uh, uh, going along the rolling direction seems it would facilitate the gauss uh, uh, for, uh, texture formation or goes against uh, the uh, yeah that's my question would it have an effect as well it is a good question and uh, i don't know the answer of that because uh, normally the the elongated grain in the hot rolled one we look at it as a cross section when you look at the uh, surface is, is all it reacts you know there is no difference but when you look at the cross section of course looking at the cross section will be different because you have a huge strain and temperature gradient across the cross section so that one is doesn't reach so also the animal is happen on the on the uh, on the surface is not happening on the core of the sample however based on our finding based on our finding the the morphology from the surface we look at it is all it reacts and if I'm saying uh, that uh, the, 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 the cross section or, 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 or these elongated grain have got effect, we cannot prove that because that elongated grain is appeared as hot rolled. When you cold roll the material, it will be completely the sheet on the cross section. It will transform to alpha gamma, alpha fiber and gamma fiber. And that's why you saw on the on the cold rolling either uh, uh, very uh, large deformation band. So they will transform to al alpha fiber and gamma fiber. These elongated grain after the cold rolling, they will disappear because most of the most of the unit cell, they will be scratched till the way till the way there one one oh it will be it will be parallel to the to the uh, to the normal direction so that image in your mind uh, sorry i cannot go back to the question this is from hot rolling and that microstructure it will already eliminated in the cold rolling cold rolling microstructure is is very complex and these nice it reacts uh, 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 grain it, it doesn't it doesn't exist anymore so when you do the primary annealing after the cold rolling, so so ignore the one you just saw because that's a from from the hot rolling that that's already disappeared. But after the cold rolling, you you do the primary annealing. Whatever we witnessed, it was it reacts nice, and and the and the thickness is already 0.3 millimeter. So we didn't expect that to have this elongated uh, grain and different morphology uh, within the surface or the cross section because the thickness is already, you will see that on the 2.3 millimeter thickness, but when you come to the cold rolling, it's already 0.3. I, I personally don't expect that morphology will, will exist before the, the, the annealing after that. that but uh, did we look at the cross section? No, uh, the, the, otherwise I don't think it will, it will, it will, it will be the case. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking if if you manage to retain these elongated grains um, it, till the cold rolling, uh, if um, uh, I know it doesn't exist, uh, if we manage to have a very flat grain uh, um, uh, boundaries, would that yeah. facilitate uh, Gauss uh, formation or would it go against? Well, practically, it's kind of impossible after cold rolling, you will have these kind of uh, grain as they are because you are reducing it over 75 reduction uh, or 85 reduction. In industrial, uh, in industrial stage, you'll go, uh, uh, you know, sometimes above 90 percent reduction after cold okay. rolling. But it practically doesn't exist. If as you said, is an assumption. If even exists, 
that morphology will affect the abnormal range rows. I don't know. OK, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. It's, um, I'm just very curious. Thank you but for me. For me, uh, there are some people. Uh, many people, as you know, guys, either you go for crystallography or the microstratomorphology. I'm a guy going for crystallography. <laughs> I think for me, if I understand the tertia, I can understand the microstructure. Some other guy, they say, no, is actually if I understand the microstructure, I will understand the tertia. But, but for me, is 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 another way. So I don't know. I, I might be, I might be right or wrong. I don't know about that. Yeah, thank you. It's very. Thorough uh, explanation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. I think due to time, we will stop it there. I'd like to say a huge thank you to someone for such a great presentation and for such in depth uh, responses to the questions as well. Um, so thank you very much, and uh, we will see you at, or oh, our guys at the next colloquium. We may not see you, Soren, obviously. And, uh, <laughs> Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your Monday and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much indeed.